Right, do you want to you take your seats quickly? Uh, there are a few free seats here on the front. All right, so shall we start? Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really good to see the lecture theatre as full as it is now again. Um, I hope that you had a really good exam period. Um, I hope it went well. Um, and I hope that you're all excited about this second semester, at least as much as I am. Uh, it's been a long and tough two years uh, with online teaching, everything being done remotely. So I hope that um, for a change we can have some, some sort of normality. Um, so this first uh, introduction lecture, I'm gonna, I'd like to start by giving you a bit of information about my background um, and what I do besides uh, teaching in terms of my research. Um, that at some point, if any of you is interested to know a bit more and to visit our labs, please do let me know. Um, we have some limited capacity in terms of the number of students that we can get into the labs, but certainly we can find time um, and accommodate um, those students and to show you uh, the new facilities in terms of manufacturing that we have at the Henry Royce Institute. Um, after that, I'll, um, I'd like to tell you a bit more about how we've structured this unit in terms of the aims and the syllabus for the second semester, uh, the program schedule in terms of the different lectures and the topics that we're going to be covering throughout the second semester, how you're going to be assessed Okay, which is also, uh, I think, quite important, and the staff that is going to be involved in the different uh, teaching activities that we have. So not just the lectures, but the tutorials, the labs, um, and also the, the other sessions. Um, and then we'll cover some uh, basic uh, definitions in terms of manufacturing engineering. There are some free seats over here on the front if you want to or maybe not. Um, and we're just going to end this lecture today with some key uh, differences between two of the most important um, technologies that we have in terms of manufacturing. Uh, CNC machining, or subtractive processes, uh, as are normally uh, known, and additive manufacturing. Okay? If at any point you've got questions, please do raise your arm. I'm going to be happy to answer any questions. Okay? All right, so um, my name is Mark Mingus. I'm a, a senior lecturer at the school at the Department of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering. But um, as I mentioned before, I'm also uh, a principal investigator at the newly established Emory Royce Institute for Advanced Materials. It's a national institute uh, that covers different areas related with advanced materials. So materials for nuclear applications, but also, for example, materials for medical applications, which is actually my research area. Um, I've got an MA in mechanical engineering um, that I have completed back uh, in Portugal. Um, after that, I did my PhD at the University of Girona in Spain. And during my PhD, that's when I've actually developed a bit more of uh, interest on additive manufacturing technologies, or 3D printing, as they're more commonly known, um, and their application in the medical area. Not just to build medical devices, but also to try and create tissue substitutes, tissues and organs. Um, I've worked as a project engineer, also, and a scientific consultant for uh, a company in Portugal for a couple of years. And after that, I've moved to the University of Manchester in 2014. Um, when I've moved here, I've, uh, I've established my research group, uh, a research group on biofabrication um, or on the application of these 3D printing technologies to create artificial organs and tissues for human transplantation. And that's what we've been doing over the last seven years. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with biofabrication, um, in very simple terms, and if you look at this image here on um, the left, um, the way that we can create tissues and organs for transplantation that are customized to patients 
that by starting with the imaging of the defect, in this case is the breast, and this is quite important and that's why I brought this uh, example because it's relevant not just for women, but for men, although probably uh, less known, but it's a, it's a disease that affects both men and women. So we start with the imaging of the defect, we then extract that and we build a computer net design model and then we use 3D printing technology to build that model that is customized for the patient. But instead of using engineering materials, what we do here is that we extract the cells from the patients, their own cells, we combine them with materials <coughs> that can replicate their natural environment, in this case our hydrogels, and then we print them, these multiple cells and multiple materials, into a three-dimensional implant, okay, which is a biological tissue substitute. And then we culture that, we promote the maturation of the tissue, and then we implant it back into the patient. And that tissue should replace the functions of the damaged or injured tissue that uh, was injured in the first place. And we do that for very different applications, not just for breasts or for other types of cancers, but we also do uh, to try and understand, for example, um, different neurovascular diseases, okay, like Alzheimer or dementia. And we do that because we cannot access human brain whilst people are alive, okay? And imaging technologies in that case are very limited. So we try to build mini brains in the lab using, again, engineering technologies to then test different drugs, different therapies, but also to try and understand how these diseases initiate and then progress, okay? And then probably the most uh, well-established area of research in our group are skeletal uh, tissue engineering, okay? So creating implants for broken bones or diseased bones, but also cartilage, intervertebral disc, um, and other skeletal applications like tendons. So this is basically what we do, and it's an area where most of you as engineers have the possibility to work, because we can combine principles of engineering and biology to restore human function, okay? So for those of you who will not uh, be completely passionate about the traditional engineering, just be aware that there are other ways or other areas where you can actually work. <laughs> Okay, so in terms of this, uh, in terms of this unit, um, Manufacturing Engineering 1, uh, when you think about companies and manufacturing engineering companies, they are quite vital for our uh, modern economy, okay? And they are vital because of their capability not just to generate high economic value, okay, in terms of the products that we generate, but also in terms of the jobs that they create. Okay? And the role of a manufacturing engineer is quite crucial um, in the, in also it requires quite advanced skills uh, in order for you to analyze but also to improve um, the complex and integrated uh, manufacturing systems that you will encounter in these industries. Okay? And that's exactly the aim of this unit, okay? to provide you with those sets of skills so that you can design a product but also add value to that product by applying different types of manufacturing technologies, okay? And in this unit, we're going to cover a wide range of technologies, starting with, for example, additive manufacturing, uh, but then more traditional technologies like casting, uh, forming, injection molding, and uh, welding. But on top of, besides having to know how to apply these technologies, depending on the product that you want to manufacture, it is also important for you as an engineer to be able to define the organization and the layout of those manufacturing technologies within, um, within a factory, okay? And this is always something that depends quite a lot on the type of product that you will be required to manufacture, the quantity, but also the requirements that are imposed normally by your customers in terms of you know, the number of, of, of parts they need to produce, but also the cost um, of those of those spots. So, as I was mentioning, in terms of the syllabus, we will be starting the first lectures with um, additive manufacturing, and in here the aim is to actually cover the 
very generally the working principles of the different additive manufacturing technologies, the materials that you can use, but also the application of these technologies. Okay? And we're going to be looking at uh, extrusion-based systems, or more commonly known as fused deposition modeling, um, sterile lithography or VAT photopolymerization, powder bed fusion, which is quite important because it allows you to actually process materials that are normally uh, used in CNC, like metals, and this is extremely important for aerospace and, and uh, mechanical engineering uh, industries. We're then going to move on to casting processes, which are more uh, traditional manufacturing systems, but still quite relevant for the production of different parts in the automotive and aerospace industry. And <clears throat> then we're going to look at polymer processing, mainly using injection molding. Okay? So we're just going to um, recapitulate a bit of information that uh, I believe by now you are familiar in terms of materials. Uh, but then how can we transform those materials into tradable products using injection molding? And then the final two topics are related with metal forming and also very importantly with uh, welding. Okay? And welding is probably the only time you're going to have contact with it during your um, undergraduate studies. So how is this structured? Um, the first uh, weeks, uh, the additive manufacturing topic is going to be delivered by me. I'll also deliver between the, the week 24 and 26 the casting, and uh, between the week 26 and 28 the polymer processing. Then Professor Mike Smith, who you will know um, at some point, will be delivering the forming and uh, the welding. Okay. You have, we'll have three different uh, tutorial sessions, okay? One on additive manufacturing, which is the first tutorial that you'll have. The second one will be on casting and polymer processing. And then the third one, mostly covering welding and forming. You'll also have um, laboratory sessions, and I'll talk a bit more about this during the lecture today, um, between week 23 and 34. And Besides the 24 hours of lectures that you're going to have um, in the three tutorials, I also, we also expect you to be able to uh, study independently for uh, at least 73 hours. Okay? And this is quite important. In terms of uh, the literature, the, you, can, you can get access to this information on the Blackboard page of Manufacturing One. Okay? I've posted this already in there. So in the library, the core textbook is this Manufacturing, Engineering, and Technology, um, which I uh, strongly encourage you to, um, to use. Okay? Uh, I'm not saying that you'll not get all the information from the lecture notes, but I believe that uh, some of the exercises and some extra information that this book contains is important uh, for you to study and to better understand the topics that are going to be covered during the, the lectures. And then, as recommended textbook, there is this one on additive manufacturing. Okay? Not essential, but um, if you want to know more about the working principles and a bit more in-depth uh, information about additive manufacturing and the applications, the materials, the costing of the, of the operations, this is a really good uh, resource for you to use. <coughs> so besides me, um, and I'm, I'm going to be the unit coordinator for this unit, there's Professor Mike Smith. Um, he specializes mostly in welding, but he's also going to cover um, uh, forming. And then we will have uh, Dr. Anastasia, um, and she will also be delivering some uh, lectures on forming and uh, welding. Throughout the semester, you'll have contact with some of our GTAs, not just in terms of the tutorials, but also in your lab sessions. So. Um, these are just six of the GTAs. We're probably going to have or need to have more. But um, they will be available to help you during the tutorial sessions, during the lab sessions. So please do not hesitate to contact them and to ask them if you've got any questions during those teaching activities. So this is a very large cohort. Uh, and I'm sure there are going to be quite a lot of questions. Um, not just in terms of the material that is going to be delivered, but also in terms of how this, the, the unit is organized. So if you do have questions, 
during the lectures, again, I strongly encourage you to ask them, but if there are questions that you prefer uh, to ask after or before the lecture, please use uh, the discussion board on uh, Blackboard. Please try not to send emails to us. It's a very large cohort. It's very difficult to manage emails. So try as much as possible to post them on the discussion board. Okay? I will be checking uh, the discussion board on a regular basis, and all the GTAs will be covering that as well. Okay? So if you post something on the discussion board, it normally takes a day or two for us to come back to you. By email, we already have a very large amount of emails that we get on a normal basis. So if you do send us emails, it will probably take much more time. So please use the discussion board, okay? The fun part, the assessments for this unit. So we have divided in uh, three components. One is the normal uh, written exam, okay? Um, this is normally a two-hour exam with four mandatory questions. It will not change the format, okay? So the format is going to be very similar to previous years, and I will give you access to uh, past exam papers. And, of course, the questions will be different, but the format, the type of questions, is going to be uh, the same, okay? So no major changes um, from previous years. Uh, you'll have two multiple-choice question tests, Okay, these are going to be uh, done on a computer cluster, so it's going to be online. Um, the reason why we have these multiple choice question uh, tests is because we found that it's quite uh, relevant for you um, to uh, at least consolidate the theoretical knowledge um, related with some of the technologies that we're going to cover here. Okay, so each quiz or multiple choice question will account for 7.5% of your final mark. So please do take advantage of this, okay? Uh, we have included them in here to actually help you with your marks, but also to consolidate your knowledge on um, some more theoretical aspects of the unit. And finally, the laboratory sessions. Um, so this is a one-hour session. It's going to be a hands-on laboratory on 3D printing. Um, and this mark will be given on attendance. So there are no reports for you to make or any questions to answer after the, 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 the lab sessions. But you do have to do some preliminary work before going into those, into those sessions, okay? And I will talk <coughs> about that. Any questions so far? No? Yes, please. Yes, so you'll have to sit uh, the quiz in, um, in computer classes. It's, it's going to be delivered as, you know, normal exam. Any other questions? Yes? This one is a question, but the written exam, are the four questions maths-based, or are they all, like, um, essay-based questions? It's uh, a mix. Okay. okay. I'll... Uh, I'll very shortly make available on Blackboard some of the best exam papers so that you can get a feeling for your, what you can expect, okay? And as I've said, it's not going to change much in terms of the format. Obviously, the questions will be different, yeah? All right, can we move forward? Yeah? All right. So, important information about, about the labs. So, the labs will be delivered by the, the labs will be delivered by our experimental offices in the 3D printing lab. The 3D printing lab is just across on the uh, Paris the building, okay? And um, really the aim is to, because we're going to, during the lectures we're going to talk about additive manufacturing, different technologies, how it works, the types of materials, the different steps that you need to follow to design and print your parts. But then, you know, it is important that you consolidate that knowledge with some um, hands-on experience. So that's really the purpose of this lab. And uh, as I've said before, um, there are no exams, there are no questions or reports to be completed, but you do have to work 
um, or to do some preliminary work before you go to the, to the live sessions. So what do you have to do? Uh, before that, as in, uh, in the previous semester, the lab groups are going to be available on Blackboard, on uh, uh, students' um, essentials. Please do check, because you're going to be divided in groups of six, okay? Very importantly, uh, these groups of six, you can only come up with one design, okay? It's not going to be a design per person, but a design per group, okay? So, you need to design this three-dimensional components using SOLIDWORKS. Uh, importantly, you need to save it as an STL file. So you've got different options to save. Look, I, I, my voice is not great today, so if you keep on chatting, you know, I'm not going to be able to, um, to finish the entire lecture, right? And I really wanted to know all this important information. Um, before you go into the labs, all right? Uh, <clears throat> so please do save it as an STL. Make sure you do that. There are different options for you to save your CAD models. This just makes it easier then when you go to the lab for you to print the components, okay? So after you do that, um, you need to export the file to the software that controls the 3D printer, um, and you can download that because it's free to download uh, from the internet, I'll tell you which software it is. And what you need to do is you need to kind of simulate the printing process. First, you need to make sure that your part fits into uh, the platform. You might need to scale it down or to scale it up. Uh, you can control the orientation that you're going to print the part, and that will dictate, that will influence, for example, depending on the orientation, how long it will take to print. Remember that you only have one hour session. Okay, so ideally what you want is to print your parts in, you know, 30 to 40 minutes, okay? Um, once you have that, once you make sure that your part is saved as an SDL, once you're sure that your part fits into the platform and can be printed within 30 to 40 minutes, you need to email that ahead of your last session, ideally, you know, a couple of days before, to mace.3dprint at manchester.ac.uk, okay? Please do include your lab group number that you can get from Blackboard and your allocated session date and time. This just makes it easier for us then to organize the sessions, okay? And make sure that we can then print your parts, okay? This here is even more challenging because um, the cohort is quite large, but if there is still time remaining, we'll do our best to print uh, additional parts, okay? So if that time becomes available, I'll let you know, and then if you want, you know, if you want to print your own parts, come up with your own design, we can try and accommodate for that, all right? Um, yeah, and then finally, during the last session, you're going to be able to actually um, upload your parts onto the machine, and you're going to be able to actually uh, visualize the printing process and get the final part, okay? Um, as I said, you can download, so we're going to be using uh, fused deposition modeling. Uh, it's called uh, a Prusa 3D printer, and you can download the software for free, okay? Once you download the software and you open it, this is what you're going to see, okay? So this is your building platform. This is where your parts is going to be um, printed. So you need to make sure that it fits in this building platform. Then there are different parameters that you can control in terms of the infill rate, but the important thing is the building time, okay? So try to scale it down or scale it up so that it can fit within a 30 minutes uh, printing time, 30 to 40 minutes, okay? And this is the software that allows you to check all those things, all right? If you have questions when you download the software, if you, or if you have any problems downloading it or using it, please do let me know, okay? And I'll try to organize an online session or to upload some online videos that will help you or guide you to, uh, through that process, all right? Okay. <clears throat> Another important thing, if you want to get some, uh, you know, some ideas about the parts they can print, 
Um, there are loads of websites that you can use. Um, Pin shape, thing inverse, and um, it's just two examples. Um, remember that one of the advantages of um, 3D printing is that um, we can print very complex shapes. So shapes that normally are quite difficult to print, or, sorry, to produce with uh, conventional ma manufacturing, like CNC, here uh, they become quite simple. Okay? So the more complex, the better. Okay? So try to be creative about the parts that uh, you want to, uh, to build, okay? And always think, if I had to produce this through subtractive methods, would it be possible or not? Because if it is possible, then that's, you know, there's really no point in using additive manufacturing. So you really want to create parts that are normally not possible of being built with CNC machining or subtractive processes that are complex, okay? And that, for example, can be personalized or customized, okay? So feel free to be creative, um, but make sure that you create your own parts. And, you know, I'm not going to be checking if you download them or not. So this is just for you, um, for your own benefit. I think that if you go through the, the entirety or all of the steps that, are, that you are required to design and print the parts, then I think you learn much more than just downloading the part from the Internet. Okay? All right. Any questions about the structure, the labs, um, the assessments? Is there anything that is not clear at this point? No. Yes. Yes, randomly pre-assigned, yeah. Sorry. I mean, we would love to, normally we would allow you guys to choose your own uh, group members, but you're just too many this year. Yes. Pardon, I couldn't hear So the quiz, they should be on your timetable, okay? One should be around week 12, okay? So halfway through, and, um, sorry, not week 12, what am I talking about? After 12 lectures, and the other one should be uh, the last week of uh, lectures, okay? But it should be on your timetable, okay? Yes. No, you don't have practice sessions for the 3D printing, okay? Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to upload some videos, because last year we did this online, so I'm going to upload some videos that uh, will help you understand, you know, how the printers work, what you can do, the type of parts, but there are no practice sessions. I mean, the lab is really for that, okay? It's for you to practice, okay? Because we're not going to do any sort of uh, assessment afterwards, yeah? Any other questions? No? All right. If you do have questions, again, please um, use the discussion board and um, we'll try to come back to you as soon as possible. So, in terms of, in terms of manufacturing engineering one, in terms of manufacturing engineering uh, in general, uh, there are several definitions uh, for, for it, okay? Um, but probably the most common one is that manufacturing engineering can be designed or defined as the design, uh, the development, uh, the implementation. Um, there are some free seats over here. There are some free seats over here if you want to. Uh, operation, but also the, the ma maintenance, which is quite important. And... Um, the entire control of uh, the processes that are normally required to manufacture a product, okay? So this is the definition. Quite broad and it involves quite a lot of different areas um, for you um, to build a product. So within, within, within this context, um, what, what is a product, okay? Any ideas? What do you consider a product? Yes? The product would produce process. Yes. So that, <laughs> it, is, it is exactly that. So a, a, a product, it is what you get from a manufacturing process, 
But very importantly, a product is an item that has value added to it because of that manufacturing process, okay? So the value of a product doesn't come only from the materials or from its design. It comes also because of the manufacturing processes that are used to transform those raw materials into a final uh, product, okay? And that value is added by a wide range of different technologies, okay? And the value of that product also depends on the technologies that you're going to use, okay? That being joining processes or additive manufacturing or CNC. So the value of that, pro of, of that product or the final cost for the consumer really depends on that as well. So just, just a bit of history, not going to bother you too much with this, but uh, the, word, the word manufacture um, actually appeared first in the English dictionary around um, the 16th century, okay? And in reality, it's derived from um, the Latin manus uh, factus, which means uh, produced or made by hand, okay? And the, the, the word manufacturing appeared later on, on the 17th century, um, and very similar, the, the word production um, appeared also around uh, the 15th uh, century. But some of the, some of the um, early references to manufacturing are, um, you know, quite, quite older than that. Um, and it probably dates back to uh, 5,000 5, or 5,000 uh, before Christ. And these are two examples. Um, this is a rock panel in the Cargo Oasis in, in Egypt. And these are the very famous paintings in France. It's the Lascaux uh, two cave paintings. So they are uh, considered the first references to manufacturing, not because they are a product, but because they have been made by hand. Okay? So that is... Uh, uh, why they are referenced as probably the, the earliest references to manufacturing. <clears throat> but the manufacturer, as we're probably more familiar with, um, appeared later on. Um, they appeared for uh, the production of uh, some uh, specific household artifacts. Uh, and these were initially produced using um, you know, common materials like wood um, or stone, sometimes, but more rarely, uh, they also used uh, metals. Um, later on, um, some of the um, other uh, products that were also uh, manufactured, um, like, for example, this bronze axe or this um, casted cannon, they were produced with um, other manufacturing technologies like hammering or uh, casting, and because simply they were uh, quite easy to, to apply. Okay? So, Casting is quite curious because although it's a quite old technology uh, that was back in the time used to create very simple components, nowadays it's used uh, to create very complex and um, highly accurate uh, products like, for example, cylinder blocks that are normally used in the automotive uh, industry. So, things that you need to be aware is that, another thing that you need to be aware is that manufacturing uh, normally comprises four uh, basic functional areas, okay? So, one is related with uh, planning. So, this is actually the first um, engineering stage towards the establishment of a manufacturing system for the production of a product. And it can involve things like, you know, the selection of uh, the materials, um, the specification of the facilities that you need to install your manufacturing processes, but also the equipment that you're going to use to not just to manufacture uh, the products, but also, for example, to inspect the quality of those products and the tools that you need to create those products. And this is probably more relevant for CNC machining, okay? That's why you need tools, because in additive manufacturing, we, you rarely need to produce any tools. And then... Also quite important, how are you going to create the layout of these different manufacturing systems okay, within the company to make sure that you can optimize the production times, but also to reduce the um, 
production costs and times of those components. The second one is the, the operations, okay? And this is important because products normally need to be produced quite efficiently, um, but also at costs that are viable for the company and for uh, your uh, customer, okay? And for that, you need quite a lot of uh, planning. So normally the activities associated with this involve, for example, improving existing layouts, okay, to minimize production time and costs and increase the production rate, uh, but also some procedures associated with the manufacturing, the testing um, of your, and the in inspection of your products, the tooling, okay, the tooling that you need to generate for those um, products, but also uh, product plans and the specifications of those products. And they're normally produced and tested according to uh, standards that are very important nowadays in uh, the industry. The third one has to do with research, okay? And this is normally more common in large, large companies, okay? Research is important because we always try to improve not just the processes, but also the materials that we use to create our uh, products. You want better materials that can provide a better performance to your products, but also you want to those materials and those processes uh, at lower costs, okay? And also quite relevant nowadays when we do uh, research to the development of these materials and processes, it's the sustainability of your materials and your processes. We need to have materials that can be recycled, materials that we can reuse, and that we can do that at a very low cost. But also we want our processes to operate um, at uh, higher uh, energetic efficiencies and lower costs. Okay? So that's why research into new materials, processes, tools is quite important for um, a company, okay? Um, finally, the manufacturing control, okay? And this is basically for the engineer and for the company to make sure that everything that is produced uh, is uh, produced ac uh, according or complies with uh, the schedules of the company, um, but also of uh, the customer, okay? So it involves, it's a quite complex operation because it involves the coordination of all the departments, okay? From the departments, uh, the purchase departments that is responsible for buying materials, tools, and everything else, until, um, you know, uh, the departments that deal with the inspection and controls of your uh, final products. So these are four functional areas that you don't need to know in detail, these definitions, but you need to be aware of these areas. Okay. In terms of manufacturing, probably one of the most important milestones was the development of what we call computer integrated uh, manufacturing methodologies. Okay? So, computer integrated manuf uh, manufacturing technologies comprise all of the software, okay, from computer ad design. Uh, computer ad engineering and uh, manufacturing, okay, um, as well as the hardware that is uh, involved from the initial product design. If I switch this off, can you still hear me? Yeah, probably even better, less annoying. Um, from the initial uh, design of your product until the manufacturing, okay? And one key element in terms of computer integrated manufacturing uh, was the establishment of computer numerical control. What, what is that? So this was first uh, implemented in 1950s, and it's a method that allows you to control the movements of a specific machine, that being a CNC tool that removes material, or that being a printhead of a 3D printer that deposits material. And it does that by providing coded numerical instructions, okay? It basically gives coordinates to uh, your tool head, okay? To move and to remove or to either deposit material. And <clears throat> this computer integrated manufacturing is key 
for both additive manufacturing and CNC machining, okay? Uh, these are the two most important um, classes of technologies, uh, but they are also quite, quite different, okay? So, and the main difference is that for CNC machining, we normally start with a block of material, and then we shape that block of material into a product by removing material, okay? So it's a subtractive process. And that is normally a limitation in terms of the geometries of the parts that you can produce, okay? One of the limitations of removing or subtractive processes is the complexity of the geometries that you can produce in your product. Different from CNC is additive manufacturing. That has a completely opposite way or working principle. We build a component by depositing layers of materials, and that's why it's an additive process. And because of that, because we are adding layers instead of removing, it gives us a much more, uh, a much higher flexibility in terms of the geometries and the complexity of the geometries that we can uh, generate. So, and although they are both controlled uh, by uh, numerical control or coded instructions, okay, they are also uh, quite different. And there are some important differences between these two technologies, starting, for example, with the uh, material. So, additive manufacturing was uh, mainly developed around polymeric materials, um, although some paper laminates could also uh, uh, be used. And more recently, we have started using composite materials, okay? Composites, for example, made of um, polymers or plastics reinforced with carbon fibers, or probably even more important and relevant to automotive um, and aerospace industry, the possibility of processing metals, okay? CNC was mainly developed for very hard, brittle materials, okay? Steels, alloys, but that doesn't mean that we cannot process uh, other soft materials like uh, foams. It is possible, but it's much harder, okay? Um, another difference is because the way that we build the parts, uh, in, one, in, a, in CNC you are subtracting, in terms of additive manufacturing you are adding layers, in additive manufacturing, depending on the parts orientation, you can induce an isotropy, okay, in your parts. So that means basically that the mechanical properties of your parts are different in different directions. That doesn't happen in CNC because you have a, an homogeneous block of material that you then shape, okay? So keep this in mind that part anisotropy is a problem, significant problem in additive manufacturing. The other difference is also about the accuracy. And before, before we talk the specific uh, ranges of accuracy that we can reach or achieve with the technologies, some important concepts that you need to know and have very clear in, in, your, in your heads. So accuracy, as I have in here, it describes how closely a manufacturing uh, machine uh, output conforms to uh, a tolerance, okay, within a specific range. In other words, or in lay terms, basically, how close is your printed or manufactured model to your CAD design, okay? Within a tolerance that you specify. The repeatability is then the ability of your machine to print those models with that level of accuracy for long periods of time, okay? The higher the number of parts that you can print with the same accuracy, the higher will be the repeatability of your uh, machine. The other one is the resolution, okay? And the resolution is the minimal feature, dimensional feature that you can achieve with um, a specific manufacturing um, process, okay? So three important concepts that are normally uh, used uh, incorrectly, okay? You need to have this uh, in mind. When we talk and when we compare the accuracy of additive manufacturing in CNC, and, you know, you don't need to know exactly those but just have in mind that normally CNC is much more accurate than additive manufacturing processes, okay? And that's also because, you know, CNC has been around for uh, much longer, 
uh, both the accuracy, resolution, repeatability normally depends also on the cost of the machine. So the higher the cost of the machine, uh, the better will be the accuracy of, this, uh, of, of the parts they're going to be printing. But the accuracy can also be a function of the size of your part. So that the, 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 the bigger dimensions, the lower will be um, the, the accuracy of your parts. Skilled labor, another difference, okay? And when you think about CNC machining, there are a number of operations that need to be um, controlled by the operator or defined by the operator, okay? And these number of operations is much higher in CNC than they are in additive manufacturing. Not just a higher number, but a higher complexity, okay? From the selection of the tools, okay, the radius of the tools they use to cut the material, um, the design of the tool paths, okay, so the trajectories they need to design and code um, and upload to the machine so that you can get the parts with the geometries and dimensions that you want, uh, but also all the operation and monitoring of the process. And this doesn't happen in additive manufacturing. I'm not saying that you don't need a skilled uh, operator, but the number and complexity of operations is much, much higher in uh, CNC than it is in uh, additive manufacturing. And I will just like to end today's lecture uh, leaving a question for you. If you would have to manufacture this cup using CNC machining, what would be the challenges that you face? Okay? Remember that uh, for, it, 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 it's about this. No, just let's do it in, uh, in the next lecture, okay? Uh, Think about that. Think about the challenge that you face. Remember that you start with a block of material, and then you have a cutting tool, okay? A tool that has a radius, that has a length, and that you need to have that block fixed into the building platform, and then removing material to shape and obtain this, okay? Think about that, and then let's talk about those challenges uh, on the next lecture, okay? Are there any final questions? Okay. All right. I'll see you. I'll see you Friday.